Good afternoon. My name is Marvin Taylor. I'm the director of the Fales Library, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to post-gender food writing, Beyond the English Lady, Betty Crocker, and the Hotshot Wine Guy, which is the first in our 2011 series of critical topics in food. Um, this is really a, lead, a red letter day for Fales. Um, I have an, an announcement to make uh, that I'm very, very, very pleased about. Um, we have just been given the George and Jennifer Lang collection of 21,000 books about food. Oh my God. Um, I'd like to ask Jennifer Lang, who's here with us, to stand. Just stand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this collection is really unbelievable because we've been building a 20th century collection largely over the past seven years. And uh, that collection uh, started with the collection of Cecily Brownstone, Dahlia Carmel has given us 11,000 volumes, uh, Betty Fessel has given us material, Merrill Evans, both of whom are here today, thank you. And uh, Ladies Home Journal and James Beard Foundation came in along the way and that magazine called Gourmet had a, a library as well. but. Um, we are now the largest collection in the country of food-related materials at more than 55,000 volumes. We are twice the size of the Schlesinger at this point. So uh, thank you all for making this happen. Um, clearly there was a need in New York City, uh, which I think is the food center of the United States, for there to be a major collection about food history. And uh, Marin Nessel came to me seven years ago and said, we don't have enough books to support research in food studies, the department that she created here almost 20 years ago. And I said, hmm. She said, I know of a collection, and that was Cecily's collection. So from then to today, largely through donation, we've built this massive collection. What's unique about the Lang collection is not only its size, but its scope. It goes back to the 16th century. It fills in materials that we didn't have uh, and including uh, European and uh, materials not in the English language. We were largely an English language collection. So the research potential now for what can be done here in Fales is really amazing. Um, but I'm not really here uh, you know, to, to do all the introductions. None of this could have happened without the support of Marion Nessel, who's here. And, and of Clark Wolf, who is the impresario behind the Critical Topics series. And, uh, so please join me in welcoming Clark for today's program. Thank you. You can applaud. <laughs> The, the rumors that cold weather burns calories are not true. Right, Marion? It's not true. So you might as well applaud for the cardio. I, I have another really delightful announcement to make. First of all, it's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, it's great when the conversations we have over the telephone, you've heard of landlines, right? Some of you? Anyway, uh, actually result in a public conversation. That's what this is all about. This is about stimulating thought and conversation. And it's been noticed by those nice folks at the Rizzoli Publishing Company. And I'm pleased to announce today that uh, the library has made an agreement with Rizzoli Books to publish a book that will come out next year that will be based on the Fales Food Studies collection called 101 Great Cookbooks from the 20th Century, Preparing for 21st Century Eating. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? I, I, what I want to say to you is that it will, from its royalties, provide funds for the processing of the papers and books that we keep getting. Because people are wonderful about giving us wonderful materials and books, but they take time and money to both store and process so that they can be available for people. And so this book, when it comes out next year, will be uh, gathered, and I want to make sure you all understand publicly, 101 great, not the best. We're not going to do that. We don't want our eyes pecked out. Um, I'm, a, I'm forming an advisory committee. One of the things that Marion and I learned early on is that if you get a lot of smart people together and ask them what they think, the result will be wonderful. So we have an extraordinary advisory committee, and that includes people like Judith Jones and Alice Waters and Michael Pollan and Betty Fussell and Laura Shapiro and Andy Smith, really people, and, and Merrill Evans, people who really know these topics. But beyond that, we're going to be reaching out for thought to our masters and PhD candidates, both past and present, to see what books they've been using over the last few years. And I'm pleased to be able to say that from here on in, and you'll see today we have two, it is our pleasure to be able to, whenever possible in these conversations, include one or more employed graduate of the Food Studies program at NYU. 
part of the reason we did all this is so that people could make their life at food. It is the largest industry in the world. It's the most important thing in the world. Forget it. Without food, we're dead. Everything we do ends up in lunch, right? <laughs> that might be my next book. Uh -huh. And so it was uh, with that in mind that we had today's uh, talk scheduled. Next two uh, scheduled dates are June 9th. And June 9th, let me grab this. I have, to, I have to get this right because I do it wrong sometimes. It's called, it's called Seriously Local, The Growing Demand for Small Farms and Their Food. Okay? We have a grad student who makes jam in Brooklyn, of course. We have a, a sheep farmer who makes cheese in Connecticut with his mom, of course. We have the president of Sterling College coming to talk about a program that they will have this summer. They needed a new cook uh, at this sustainable ag college in Vermont. And so I suggested rather than just get a chef, they get a program. You know, that they let the chef of the school be the head of a new summer cooking and, and, and growing program. And that's what they're doing. So he'll be here to talk about that. And then in October, uh, I think the date is the 13th, the meat of the matter, we will revisit beef in American life. And it's not a simple topic. It's, as, as Betty can tell you, it's a complex one. And we'll be doing it in fresh ways, hopefully with some of our students. But today... I was reading the New York Times. As, how many of you read the New York Times? Come on. <laughs> how many of you download it and will pay $12? Forget <laughs> it. OK. Uh, and, and it was announced, and, and I'd heard this before, that uh, a fellow who I um, liked a lot and who I kept seeing uh, uh, early on and it had kept in my mind had been appointed um, the new editor-in-chief of the country's largest uh, generally consumed food magazine, mostly read by women. It's a guy who I had seen uh, uh, when he was around the Beard Foundation and also at Time Out when we really trusted what they said, quite frankly, partly because <laughs> of him. And then he went on to, to write style and fashion and culture and all kinds of stuff. And I kept saying to him, you'll be back. <laughs> You're too good at food and you like it too much. And, and uh, his name is Adam Rappaport and he's here today. And the thing I like about Adam is that he's a, a family guy who's got a lovely wife and child and also cares about how his jacket looks. <laughs> and what his haircut does for him. Uh, got it? And uh, it's all good. And so I said, Adam, congratulations. This is by email, by thumbnail. Uh, I said, we want to do something called post-gender food writing. Because I used to say that the voice of American cookery was an aged English woman, including James Beard. <laughs> right? And then Ruth Reichel put this sexy guy with a large fish on the cover of Gourmet Magazine, right? And Tony Bourdain started talking trash. And so it was hotshot, you know, testosterone-laden knives and fire guys. And then it was girly, girly, bloggy, bloggy. <laughs> right? How do I really feel? But... And so what's happened is there, there's been an evolution so that each of you who has your own voice can really kind of choose more than you ever could before, I believe. That's my conjecture. Of course, I'm usually wrong. So I thought this would be a good thing to talk about. And we gathered a group to talk about that today. And we're going to. Adam uh, responded, oh, that'd be really interesting because he said, I was just talking about post-gender food writing with the staff I yesterday. I said gender neutral. But ne gender I, neutral. I didn't know the phrase post-gender. <laughs> Uh, I, but now I use postpartum. How, how about postpartisum? Postpartisum. Yeah. Forget it. I no. don't know that one either. So we're going to begin. First of all, help me welcome Adam Rappaport. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. All right, Adam, uh, tell us a little bit. Let's start with the, uh, the, the premise that post gender or, or, or gender neutral food writing is a relevant topic as the editor now of Bon Appetit. And what, what, what did you talk to your staff about? What, what's, what's the notion in your mind? I, mean, I guess a few things. Can you guys hear me back there? Yes. Yeah. Um, and by the way, these are very sensitive. Okay. And not emotionally sensitive. They actually pick up well. <laughs> right. um, you know, I mean, interesting. You mentioned when I, when I took the job and was, was fortunate enough to get the job, and I found the readership was seventy five percent women. That just struck me as a little odd. Like, well, you know, I don't. I, I never thought of as eating food as a gender specific endeavor. You know, um, and, and and that's something I wanted to work on in terms of like, well, let's get it to be a more of a fifty fifty sort of balance. And and so in terms of hiring a staff. Um, you know, I think I've been pretty good at that in terms of men and women, about 50-50. Um, but in terms of food writing, it's like, I, I just think that, you know, A, I want my writers to, you know, have a point of view, 
have a sense of humor, and to know what they're talking about. And Wait a second. Can we put that on stone? Yeah. But it's like, you know, I don't know how, how any of those are particularly masculine or feminine traits. Right. And, and it's one of those things where it's like, I always tell young writers, if you're writing, I want you to write like we're just sitting here at a bar talking to each other about like the best burger you just had right. or this amazing new, you know, French place you discovered, whatever. Um, that's how you should write. And, 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 there, and I've worked with, you know, coming from a men's magazine where admittedly you will skew a bit more masculine and you'll throw around the phrase bro now and then perhaps air quotes are not withstanding um but you know like we back at gq when i was there for 10 years liz gilbert was writing for us and and liz was you know i'd, I'd probably say the best writer on staff and she could talk shit and take shit like anyone on staff <laughs> and you didn't think of her as like a girl or you know there was right. nothing feminine about liz's writing at least before eat pray drink love um but you know <laughs> eat drink pray love whatever it's called um uh, you know, so I guess I, I just thought about that, you know, it's whether it's a man or a woman, you want someone with a voice and with a point of view. And, and I just never understood how that can be a masculine or feminine thing. And I think if you look around now, you know, if, you know, I read the Times food section, my 77 year old mom reads the Times food section, I'll go into Grove Street, I don't ever think of those as masculine or feminine. I just think that them being informed um, with Grub Street, you've got obviously certainly more voice and attitude, and that's fine for what it is, and that's great. Um, you know, but honestly, I don't know who's writing the Grub Street stuff or editing it necessarily, but it's 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 it's, it's, it's voice and it's a take on something. And um, like I said, there's there's nothing about gender in any of that. Well, all right. So before we go on to the next person, I want to just ask you about three people since you mm -hmm. brought up the New York Times. Mm -hmm. We have had. I used to say that um, the first uh, critic of the New York Times was Craig Claiborne, who was the original Southern gentleman, arbiter of taste, queer eye for the straight guy. I mean, let, right, that's, that's Craig. And then it was the immigrant auntie, Mimi Sheraton, who shake, shook her finger at you and told you what was what, right? Uh, and then it was the everyman, Brian Miller, who just kind of kept ahead of the culture and said, oh, look, uh, uh, there, there it is. And then it was the prodigal daughter, Ruth Reichel, who came back in her very writerly, very 11th Street, very MFK Fisher, yeah. very... Could tell a story beautifully. Could tell a story beautifully. Anything. So if I give you three people um, that write, have written for the New York Times as restaurant critics and their writing, just give me your quick response. Masculine, feminine, neutral, okay? So Ruth Reichel. Feminine. Sam Sifton. Masculine. Mm, <laughs> masculine. Frank Bruni, I would say, is neutral. Frank, no, Frank Bruni goes both ways. Yeah, well, that's all right. Right. No, I think. Moving right along. Uh, okay. Uh, that's all right. He has a column now called the Tipsy Hoo Hoo or whatever yeah. it's called, right? Okay. We'll get back. Okay. Uh, Adam, thank you very much for setting the stage. Thank, thank you. you. All right, now Lisa McLaughlin uh, actually headed up the food and drink and lifestyle coverage of Time Magazine for 10 years, now a part of uh, Tina Brown's backyard. No, that's Newsweek. Yeah, all right. She wrote for InStyle, you write for InStyle, and Edible, Edible Manhattan, and Edible Brooklyn, and Fodor's, and now she's working as the chief, uh, as, as the chief editor, right, for Marcus Samuelson and his new venture. It's going to be called Food Republic, and it's a new online publication directed primarily at a men's readership. Please welcome Lisa McLaughlin. Okay, so Lisa, tell us, uh, based on the way Adam has described those writers from the New York Times, who are you gonna hire? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> tell us what you mean by a, 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 a men's directed publication in food. You know, for me, when I was first approached about the job, it was intriguing to me because it, it appealed to sort of the way I read about food and the way I write about food, and it meant that I have a really long reprieve from writing about cupcakes <laughs> sometime. Um, but I do think, like, I started my career at Time, and when I started, I started as an intern, and Mimi was still there. And she was just about to leave. And just by chance, I sat across from where all the critics were, just because that's where an empty cubby hole was. And I remember hearing one of the, scene, the managing editors, when Mimi was leaving, saying, that's OK. We're covered with our critics. We don't need a food critic. <gasps> And it struck me as bizarre that, you know, in the early 90s, they thought having a classical music critic was <laughs> far more important to their readership than a food critic. Yeah. Um, because food was still seen as a very feminine topic and a very... So I think, you know, over the past decade, you know, it's, it's moved much more <coughs> to being gender neutral. And it's about, I think, you know, people react to food in ways that, you know, 
define them. You know, so sort of the way music would have defined you or fashion, you know, didn't attach you to a tribe. So I think, you know, there's there's an edible person or a bon appetit person, hopefully a food republic person. Um, but so it is, it's less frilly, but still really passionate about food, I think is the direction. So you would define in. food gender neutral as without cupcakes? Yes. Okay, no, all right. It's a well, big part of my editorial. And it, okay, right. And, and, and uh, it, when do you launch? Uh, March 11th. Okay, oh my goodness. Ooh, and uh, give us some of the titles of some of the pieces that are in this first one. Um, you know, we've got a great um, mix of, uh, we're about, I'd say, 50-50 male-female writers, and it also in terms of staff at the Marcus Samuelson Group, so it's sort of a, a vibrant group. Um, we've got a great story about someone hunting groundhogs. <laughs> we've got um, a lot of chef contributors um, writing about fishing and kitchen stories and that sort of thing. So there is, there's, I mean, I guess that's where our masculine edge sort of more comes in, where huh. it's a lot, you know, there is some blood and guts involved. <laughs> W women do that rather well, then right. they run for governor. Right. Uh, <laughs> great. All right. Well, we can't wait to, to see it, right? We'll all subscribe, right? Let, right? Good, good luck to you. All right. By the way, as many of you who've been here before know, we do take questions on your 3 by 5 cards that we put down there. And as we go through, uh, once we get towards the end, and I've got a few questions, of course, ready to go, y you'll pass them down and we'll ask them one by one. Uh, Lauren Shock, uh, Shockey, did I say that right? Uh, is a f staff food writer, and she's not supposed to say that she's one of the critics, um, at The Village Voice, rockin', right? Uh, where she writes weekly restaurant reviews and blogs daily. Her writing also has appeared in numerous publications, including The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Gastronomica, Slate, and The Atlantic Food Channel, among others. Lauren is also the author of a forthcoming, pick it up, show it, show the book. We have to teach her, don't we, everybody? Right, we have to teach her. Yes. Orders be taken, yeah. Memoir with recipes entitled Four Kitchens, which recounts the years she spent uh, uh, apprenticing in restaurant kitchens in New York, Hanoi, Tel Aviv, and Paris, all very female-friendly places. <laughs> a graduate of the University of Chicago, Lauren also holds a diploma in classic culinary arts from the French Culinary Institute and a Master of Arts in Food Studies from NYU. Please welcome Lauren. All right, Lauren, yeah. bend the mic towards you. Yeah, there you right. go. Okay. Does that work? That works perfectly. All right, so Lauren, tell us a little bit about um, how it is to be a, a young woman uh, with credential. I mean, feels good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have more credentials than most people who've been around for thirty or forty years. I mean, really, you have some credentials that didn't exist before. How has that worked for you? Um, I mean, I guess I was lucky in that I was growing up at a time when sort of people were just starting to get interested in food, and basically, since I was a senior in, in high school, really, I wanted to be a food writer. And that's really how I got into the business. I wrote Amanda Hesser at the New York Times a letter saying I was a big fan and I would work for her for free. And basically, I just sort of continually worked to that step of becoming a food writer. I went to culinary school so I could have the technical background, and then NYU for sort of the theoretical background. Um, so it is really interesting to see sort of how these credentials are more and more relevant. I know work, getting the job at The Voice, it was essential for to have a culinary degree, which I don't think you would have seen 10 years ago. Um, when people just wrote about food because they felt, you know, they, they enjoyed writing about food. It's funny, uh, Biff Grimes, who was a critic of the New York Times in the restaurant, William S. Grimes, actually once said out loud and in public and in print, there's no credential for being a restaurant critic. Right. And you have them. Wait, why, why did you need a culinary degree to become a restaurant critic? Um, I mean, I think it gives me a better understanding mm -hmm. of sort of the technical aspect. But do you think the voice wanted you? You said the yeah, voice... Yeah, in my interview they said we, it was required. we were only going to hire someone who had a a culinary degree. That's crazy. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's like saying you have to go to journalism school to be a journalist. Right. Yeah, well, I think it would be a good idea, actually, Adam. We'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, as a matter of, go ahead. Um, I mean, I guess I benefited from yeah, that. No, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like top, but yeah, I don't know. Um, just like, that's just another just culinary like, term, by the way. Yes. <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just sort of I was in the right place at the right time. I think going to grad school for food studies was particularly interesting because it was about 95% female. Yeah. Um, I would say men and women are all becoming more interested in food, but the people studying food right now are very much women. Um, and I think that's because it, it's also an emerging field the way sort of gender studies is, where we don't really know what food studies is or where it's going to go. Um, but right now, where it sort of has a cultural focus, I think it's more women, whereas, you know, agriculture and sort of where it might be 10 years from now is sort of focused on men. Um, That's actually an interesting thought. And, uh, but but what, what I also found interesting is that a number of the people who started the artisan food uh, uh, 
uh, points of interest across the country have been women as well. Mm -hmm. Goat cheese, right? Jam, small, small berry farming. So you think in 10 years, it may do another little thing. Do you, any other particular challenges or particular experiences about being a young woman and being in a, in a, in a regular journalistic context? Um, I mean, not as much, really. I would say sort of, you know, my gender doesn't really come into my writing as much. I would say, you know, when I go out to eat, you know, one thing I wrote about recently is um, if I'm with a man, he will always get poured the wine. I would never get, you Still. Know. Yeah, <laughs> still. 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 Um, and I think, you know, also because of my age, people just don't really assume I'm a restaurant critic. <laughs> Isn't her middle name Yelp? Yeah, you know. Uh, all right, um, Lauren, Lauren it, I think it's fascinating. We're going to get back to some of this. We're not going to lose this. But let's, let's thank Lauren for a, a good start. You know, th this next speaker is really interesting. Well, she is interesting. She's wonderful. But it's because it, she was part of the construct in my mind because Rene Sachs actually worked with James Beard many, many years ago on that. And she's also one of the classic New York food journalists who has worked in a newspaper or two or three yeah. for years and years and years, long the domain of guys with a bottle of scotch in their drawer, right? Yes. yes. And now she, uh, she writes the Cheap Eats column for the Daily... No, the Daily News hasn't had restaurant reviews for over a year. No. I must pick it up sometime. But, but I, I used to until they... Killed the column. Got it. Because it costs money. Because it costs money. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. But but Rini actually still uh, uh, is an adjunct professor at our department. She was Lauren's teacher, so apparently it works. Please <laughs> welcome Irene Zacks. All right. So I was I was Lauren's teacher, and there she was turning in assignments on time, perfect. Yeah. And then I find out that at the same time she's going to the FCI. <gasps> at the same time. Two programs. <laughs> it's what they call the fire in the belly. That's right. And that's what you really need. And that's what you really need. Well, yeah. all right. So, Rini, what do you see? Did you ever have a hard time being in a newspaper? I loved it. I loved every moment of it. Um, however, when I started in newspapers, I was in the women's section. Yeah. I, I would step up. But, um, although, although that, yes, and although there were women um, editors, they were always feature editors. They oh, weren't hard soft, news. What they call that soft news. Yes, they weren't yeah, where the hard money news is. editors. Yeah. Um, uh, I happen to, well. No, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. You talked about girly, girly, bloggy, bloggy. <laughs> and Was that me? I, and I, he was referring I, to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say something about that. Please. I think that for women, re recipes, sharing recipes is a form of communication yes. that goes way, way, way back. And that your women who give a recipe to someone are giving are are both communicating with them and are telling them a story. And very often, women didn't have anything but recipes to give. And so the whole tradition of sharing recipes with friends, which also got into recipe swaps and then into places like Epicurious, where there are forums in which people swap recipes. And now all the women's blogs is a, a time-honored female form of communication. The Junior League cookbooks are some of the best in the country. Well, either they're good or they're not, but they, ha they are more than <laughs> cookbooks, really. Yeah. I mean, well, all right. So, so Rini, uh, you, but when we were talking on the phone about this. I had to get that in. She I feels knew much it better. wasn't going to come up as a <laughs> yeah. question. Yeah. So. Oh, oh, it will. Uh, you had talked about the fact that you actually said you, you're not sure you agreed that you thought that MFK Fisher and Julia Child wrote more like men. Did I say that? Yeah. Well, okay. I can't, I, what do you think you meant? No, I, I came to think more about this subject after we talked. Uh, and I, I don't agree anymore. I, th <laughs> I think also that there have been areas of food that have always been male and always been female. I think that, I mean, I'm not saying that women couldn't write those things, but they didn't. They weren't, often weren't allowed to. I think men wrote about restaurants. They wrote about the professional kitchen whereas women wrote about home cooking. Men wrote about wine. Women wrote maybe about uh, cocktails. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, men, men wrote about luxury and gourmandise. Women wrote about thrift. Uh, and, I mean, like yeah, MFK yeah. Fisher. Uh, thrift, um, uh, uh, equipment, you know, appliances. Men wrote about hunting. Women wrote about shopping yes. and clipping coupons. Male and female food writing has traditionally been two different subjects. Now, some people go from one to another. I mean, yes, you've got Anthony Bourdain and I guess people like A.J. Liebling, you know, really 
masculine figures. <coughs> and then on the other hand, on the, at the other end of the scale, you've got people like Mrs. Rombauer, maybe, or um, Laurie Colwyn, small and domestic, yeah. or uh, Ruth Reichel, who when she was reviewing restaurants was noticing the pocketbook that the woman at the next table was carrying. Yeah. Now, I don't think any man would have done that. Frank, 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 Frank Bernie would have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. The and, the, and the shoes and the tie. And, yeah. and, 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 and did he eavesdrop also? Because she used to eavesdrop. He eavesdropped and he was wearing the same clutch. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Rini, but, but let's go back to what your thinking was, because again, some of the great benefit of all this is thinking, right? Yeah, is is right. the conversation. Oh, yes. When yeah. you said you thought that Julia and MFK might be a little bit more traditionally masculine. You, you, t you were talking about writing with a, th a certain kind of authority. Will you explain what you were thinking, even though you came to think something else at the end? Um, what I, oh yes, I, okay. So it had to do with authority, although I'm not sure MFK, uh, MFK Fisher's authority was female. I'm sorry, I, I yeah. have, I've completely turned around. She it's was- It's a prerogative. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can Ooh. say these things. Glad I didn't say I that. Whoa. Go ahead. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think if you want to talk about voice, I think yeah. Julia is just Julia. I mean, I think that is one of the most recognizable yeah. voices in all food writing. But the two of them, no. I, I think men wrote with authority, women wrote as girlfriends or mm. as aunts. And I think that maybe that's gone away. I mean, what do you what do you do with someone like Mark Bittman, who writes in um, who who writes in what I consider female areas, recipes, and now nutrition? My God, you never had male nutrition writers, right? That that's extraordinary, and that's that's a, a really good jumping off point because, as you may have read or heard, Mark Bittman is now writing for the op ed page, mm. and the exciting part about it is that there's going to be somebody who cares and knows a bit about food writing for the op ed page. Yeah. What a concept, wow. right? The most important thing, uh, Rini. Thank you for those thoughts. Thank you. That absolutely wonderful. All right, now. As Mitchell is, is kind of going to the next step, it's, it's time to write those questions down and try to make them not all about Frank Bruni. No, no, I'm teasing. Uh, so uh, Mitchell Davis was the first uh, um, PhD candidate to begin the program, not the first to finish it, but the first to begin like the program. Like back in 1964, Mitchell? 18, 18, 1841. We only had nine books. Food. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and, but my, Mitchell also, as you may know, is the vice president of the James Beard Foundation. He's written it four of his own, four? of his own cookbooks, he now does have a PhD that f uh, focused uh, on, on food elites and their impact. So Mitchell is also actually going to be giving us an essay for the book, and he's going to be writing about the impact and the influence of James Beard. What a good idea for the guy who is the <laughs> VP of the press, right? Uh, but Mitchell has a, 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 a viewpoint all his own, and I said, Mitchell, to prepare for this, do everything you've done in your life and tell us what you think. Mitch please welcome Mitchell Davis. Clark, you clap a lot yeah. for yourself. Feels good. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, how come everyone else got a leading question and I didn't? Yeah. Interesting. Um, I can give you a leading question, no, no, Mitchell. No, 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 do you no, think no, anything no. that's been said before you is true at all? <laughs> well, actually, that's a good question. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, that's what I do. No, but one, I, I mean, I do think we have to take, our, as often food people do, we are stuck in our, our rarefied world of people who care about these things as much as we do and forget that there's a world outside of food. and. I, I do think you have to look at food writing outside just food and writing, but into the trends happening in the larger culture when we're talking about things like gender and even interest in food and the changes that have gone on in, in gendered places through the advent or through the process of feminism or whatever it is. I mean, there are so many words and so many difficult things that, that we kind of, people like to say we live in a post-gendered world today, not just of food writing, but world. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine that being true when every time I turn on the TV, there are boobs and high heels and, and necklaces swinging around and, and um, well, on the food, that's just on the Food Network. <laughs> on, uh, I, mean, I was going to say it was on, just on Logo. The other place, yeah, right. So, so to me, you know, I don't, I don't even know what a post-gendered world is like because there are men and there are women. I mean, I think something that Irene said echoed what I was thinking as the conversation was going along is that there are food writers who operate within the world of writing, um, which has its different pressures from different people, whether you're in a newspaper or a magazine or who's allowed to do what or who has access to what or where your pages are vis-a-vis -vis the other pages. 
And then there is the act of food and cooking. And professional kitchens have always been more masculine, and they continue to be. You just have to read Gabrielle Hamilton's book, new book, to know what the life of a woman in, a, in the restaurant world can be. And that's now and before and probably tomorrow. Um, and then the domestic sphere has always been a different place of cooking. So I think um, what's changed outside of that, outside of the genderedness of the writing and the food, is the role that food has now plays in a much broader place. So I think that Adam has a charge of turning a magazine um, that used to give recipes for women to cook dinner, which was largely what Bon Appetit was, because that was who was interested in recipes um, uh, were women who needed to cook dinner into this new crazy world we're in where recipes are on Jimmy Fallon show and people are cooking, you know, <laughs> in the basements of, of apartments in Brooklyn. They're making, you know, charcuterie and they don't even have licenses and then they're <laughs> selling them. And, you know, like we, th the food has changed so much outside the context of gender or the time. When, when James Beard wrote the first cookbook by a man, which was only in 1949, and it was outdoor cookery, or James, you know, there was a giant picture. It looked, it seems so contemporary, because he's on the cover, which never happened uh, until 10 minutes ago, with the author of the book is on the cover. Now, ev the author's on every cover. Right. But there he was, next to the barbecue, of course. It was called Grill It Outdoors. And I might have the date wrong, so the historians I'm looking at in the office, please, in the audience, I should say. Um, but, but that was a radical thing for him to yes. write that book and put himself in front of people. It wasn't written for women. It was a cookbook written for men to cook. And it was no surprise that he was barbecuing, because that was one of the places men cooked. It still is one of the places men cook. Um, okay. So I, I, I mean, I think that some of the changes going on reflect the, the, more, the broader interest of food that we all have. And it's now OK uh, to, to cook. But I, I, I actually don't believe we're in a post-gender world. I don't know what that means. And I don't, I don't, I don't know that we want to be there. Um, I do think. Um, that food ha has broader appeal and attracts men and women. And I thought I was here because I was the gay person on this panel, and that's another gender you might argue or something. But, but, uh, but that has, I mean, even the ability to, to acknowledge that has changed so drastically in writing, in television, and everything that we live in this sort of postmodern time more than postgender, where, where identities and, and the cultural icons that we slap on ourselves to identify ourselves have changed, and food is just another piece. I'm happy, happy that it's the moment that it's the thing that interests me most. But, but I think there's there's broader things going on than just what we read about food. Even though what we read about food has has, um, you know, ex, uh, grown exponentially. Uh, we should all talk about Gabriel Hamilton, Hamilton's book because it's been that, that's the book, uh, uh, right? What is it called? A blood. <laughs> Blood, bones, and butter. butter. Blood, bones, and butter, the, the story of lunch, right? <laughs> no, uh, but uh, it, it was said to me on the phone today that her writing, while powerful and at times um, uh, very intense, was uniquely uh, female. That, that, it, it, that it's really, really hard work, but it's not showy or testosterone-laden. And this was said to me uh, uh, by a very smart woman. Would you say that, that about Gail Green? Not showy or testosterone-laden? That's... <laughs> I mean, you know... That's a wonderful question. Do you what all know who Gail George Green is? Elliot. What about, like, what does that mean that the writing is not female? I don't even know what that yeah. means. Right, okay. All right. Well, have, you ever, have you ever read Glamour or Vogue magazine? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in all seriousness, and I, and I, Please, Gabrielle, do Gabrielle's, Gabrielle's book is phenomenal. And she's right. an amazing writer, and she wrote for me when she was at G, when I was at GQ for at times. and And... And you know, I, two things I think. I think if part of it's in the, I guess, the eye of the beholder or the reader or whatever. Sure. If it's, it's what is the reader comfortable with? And as a guy, I was always comfortable reading Ruth Reichel, and she, I, you know, she wrote very differently than I would write. But I could appreciate. I love reading her every Wednesday morning, and it was like she, that's her point of view. Just as Julia would have her point of view, and you would love to read Julia, and you know right. that, you know. And so I think that's part of it is. Are people are guys now more comfortable reading from a woman who's smart and knows what she's do, talking about, and that's and that's great. And then, in terms, of what was my other question about uh, Gabrielle? In terms of is is it a, is it a male experience? Well, yeah. And one thing I was saying. Oh, the other thing, Mitchell, is just that if you if you I can't tell you how many times I interviewed young women at GQ who wanted to work at GQ because they didn't want to work at a women's magazine because yeah. they felt the writing they were going to have to do at Glamour or Lore or, or you know Cosmopolitan wasn't going to let them have the voice, the sense of humor, the sort of the, the, the boldness or the brashness that they would want to be able to write with. And, and that's unfortunate. And so they wanted to go work at Esquire would or GQ. Would you say that they want to then write like men? No, I think they want to be able to write like they're, they're, they, want to, they want to be able to express their natural it, it voice. Like, I'm like, smart. I'm it, funny. I know what I'm talking it, about. It, it sounds like they want to write post-gender. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lisa, I want to ask you. I'm not, I'm not saying that yeah, magazines yeah, like yeah, Esquire or GQ can't skew too macho. Men. Boys, boys, calm down. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, uh, don't get hysterical. I think that's what you're supposed to say. That's anyway, also yeah. 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 See, I just used it. Uh, Lisa, it Lisa, wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop, stop. I'm in control here. Lisa, kind of. Kind of. You think. Lisa, right. Lisa, so, I mean, it, it's been brought up, and we, we can't help but notice that, uh, what is her name, Lakshmi, right? That, uh, Padma, uh, right, whatever, right? That, that she jiggles, and she kicks water. It's just so unfortunate. And, and I mean, it really, it, I lose my lunch. I like pretty girls, but please. But the fact of the matter is, Lisa, tell us, there, a lot of food television is being directed at men as the new frontier. I mean, come on, I talk to marketing people and I talk to television and all the time and they say, whatever we're saying here intellectually and, and in an enlightened sense, they are trying to get when, when they had, what is the wo English woman's name? with Nigella uh, Lawson. When she was hired to oral, <laughs> orally please asparagus in the New York Times monthly, what the hell was that? It was clearly, Johnny Apple said, an attempt to get more men to pick up the newspaper. But and. Why but they want that because men buy cars and cars right. spend more money right. in advertising and advertising is what drives So Lisa, so Lisa, so, so Lisa, <laughs> sit, sit. Lisa, let, uh, is, is that what you're thinking? That basically if you go towards men, you'll be able to sell Lexus? Um, yeah, part of it is that there was a, you know, so we saw a definite gap in the market there where men weren't being talked to about food in, in a natural way. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, come on, it's no, all right, no, I know. it's okay. Well, no, and it's also, it's kind of the way it reflects the way our particular group sees, you know, we're, we're a company that's founded by a male chef. Right. Um, everyone in the company is really passionate about food. Right. Um, and it just, it was a natural fit for what we were doing. All right, well, I'm gonna, I mean, since, you, yeah. since you work with Marcus, uh, one of the questions that were asked was, I noticed this before we began the panel, somebody wrote down, you're all white. You know, all right, it's my fault, okay? It's my fault. But you're Does working. Does Jewish count? There, you, no, yeah, actually. The food writing business. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish and gay, forget it. Uh, the, the, uh, you're the editor, right? The, um, not you. Anyway, you work for a man who has a lot of ethnicity and a lot of culture in his background. And a lot of people have said that Marcus is a perfect post-gender, post-racial, post-ethnic, post Toasties. I mean, you know, how does that work? Why did this come from him, and, and what's the directive? Um, I, yeah, I do think you know, Marcus represents a lot of those things, and as a company, we do too. Sort of like it's really important that we we are diverse. I mean, it, some of it's just natural and organic who comes in, who fits, but it's also a, a conscious decision that you know we sort of look around and, and you know there's lots of languages spoken, there's lots of all right, all right. So so Lauren, wait, wait, Lauren, Lauren, hold on, L Lauren at the Village Voice. Right. This is the alter, the original alternative newspaper, probably owned by a, an oil company by now, right? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, but the Village Voice was this kind of alternative situation, right? And it was always done by uh, uh, hipsters and beats and whatnot. And by the way, those of you who remember the uh, political far left, <laughs> it was a way for Jewish guys to get a date. Let's be honest. I mean, I mean, the, 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 there's always been a sexuality to every political act. Let's be honest, right? But the fact is, you're the Village Voice. Is there a dynamic, and I know you're, you're the, d turn off the camera for a second. Uh, no one's gonna be sued over this, but the fact of the matter is every context does have dynamics. We're almost not allowed to talk about it anymore. But the fact is, do you feel any of that there, or do you feel completely gender neutral? Do you get to feel like a young woman? I mean, what, what, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, you know, on our food staff, it's um, three food writers and who are female and one who's male. And I think the Village Voice is actually pretty good about having a 50-50 female-male ratio. Um, and I don't know, I, I would say sort of, you know, I, I wrote a food memoir and I think <coughs> memoir is still something that's very much female written. And maybe that's just because talking about ourselves has been perceived as, as a female thing. Um, that's, that's really interesting because we had a, a writer, the fellow who's from the, uh, who wrote about Mario Batali who came in Crocs and a suit. What's his name? Uh, who writes for the, what? Bill Buford. Bill Buford, Bill Buford, Bill Buford. Yeah. who wrote a memoir, yeah. right? Yeah. And it was very much a, 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 a guy thing. Right, but you're saying that memoirs really feel like a female thing. Rini, so. comment. Especially, oh, sorry. Um. <laughs> she's your student. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do what he says. He's a man. Yeah. Right. Oh. Right, 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 right. No, no, no. I'm in charge um, today, no, briefly. I know, again, right. well, um, yeah, I guess. I mean, there have been, and I mean, think Angela's ashes. Think, I mean, mm. maybe some of the best ones are masculine. I, I think the. Ooh. <laughs> I okay. May I think I think that the Ooh. spate the 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 
huge numbers of memoirs are perhaps female in that it, I think what Lauren said is true. We're, we're used to thinking, oh, here's something interesting, <laughs> me, you know? <laughs> um, you know. And, and we're, we're used to thinking of our stories as, as important and not just something to shrug off and say, you know, oh, well, that was yesterday. Yeah. You know, I think most, most accomplished people in any field uh, have come to feel in this culture that they're supposed to write and talk about themselves, right? They're supposed to have their own reality television show, their own line of jewelry, yeah. and that's just the boys. Uh, Adam, so, I mean... Well, I mean, obviously, you write about what you know. And, and whether and that's the first thing you know whether Gabrielle Hamilton has another book in her I don't know you know Ralph Ellison didn't but he, you write about your life story uh, and then once yeah. you've written your life story well where do you go from there or maybe if you're lucky enough to be a restaurant critic you write about going out to dinner every night all um, right so so oh, so that being this case, you're an yeah. editor and you've watched this going on for some period of time what are the books about food being in food cooking food making food creating food that you still haven't read that you'd love to see in print by someone and you don't have you mean to with the type of book. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I don't, you know, I guess I, I I would think less about the the kind of book and more about the writer, about the voice. And as an editor, on uh, when you're editing a magazine, there are certain writers, you know, who you know have a voice and you want them to use that voice. And there are certain writers on staff who you expect to be to be more of the reporters, the foot soldiers. And, and you don't think about that as being whether it's Amanda Hesser or or Frank Bruni or or Ruth Reichel. Some are women and some are men. And some are, or, or Liz Gilbert or whoever. You just you let you you pick those writers out and you let them run with it, and and, and that's just like do they have a voice or don't they? And and that's like I said I said before that's not a masculine thing or feminine thing. Mitchell, I've, go ahead. I've lived over. I've written over a period when when I started writing, you weren't supposed to write about yourself. Right. You were. Yeah. It was supposed to be not just gender neutral, but neutral. You voice were neutral. To, yeah, voice neutral. And then that's completely. That's complete. All, all right, well, let's talk change. about that because it, it was in, yeah. in newspaper reporting and newspaper yeah. writing, it was supposed to be voice neutral or yeah. it was supposed to be the voice of the institution. Right. Right. And but, even Craig, to some extent, even even as a critic, he was neutral. His his voice was neutral. But yeah, but that, I mean, with new journalism and gay to lease yeah. and everything, yeah. Esquire right. magazine in the 60s, right. that all changed. Yeah. And, and so, right. And so did know. the power dynamic because that voice that you were not supposed to use was still a man's. And I think at mm. a certain point, the huh. way that women put voice women had a voice was to assert, to write about themselves in, in contradistinction to men in some ways. Uh, no, I'm getting a shrug in the audience. <laughs> but, <laughs> write it down on a card and pass it to me, <laughs> like, a, like a subway card. I mean, I, 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 go ahead. I just feel like identity, the, the, the advent of writing about me is sort of the product of a process of identity politics where you, all the me's that didn't have any voices wrote to be heard or chose to, chose to be heard. We are now in the, the other end of that pendulum swing where no one will shut up ever. <laughs> exactly. but, but, but there was a moment there where there were no other voices. There was just a dominant voice and it was a man's. It was usually a white man's and it was, it was you know, all that could be heard. Um, but, okay, but, in, just, but in food, it yeah. was also, it's, it's certainly in cookery, it was a sexless woman. But it was interesting. I, I must, I, maybe can, someone knows better than I, but I remember when Amanda Hesser started writing for the Times a lot, and she was writing a lot when she started. And as far as I could tell, she was not so popular with the order guard in the Times food section because here was this young woman who had very much her own voice and writing in a very first-person point of view. And I don't know if you remember, but it just seemed like that didn't go over so well with the older women at the staff who never were able really to allow to write that way. I think that's probably true. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was also t tiny and cute, yeah. which didn't help. <laughs> what, what about illustration and photography? Uh, uh, some of the great illustrators actually in some of the earlier cookbooks were women who could you know found a, a voice for their talent that way? And some of the early photographers, it was very specifically the man was the photographer, the stylist was the woman. How how does that work for all of you? What, what's uh, going to happen? Uh, each of you start over there, Mitchell. Me photographers. I thought they were all gay. No, <laughs> they're not. No, they're not. No, no. 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 Those um, are the models. No. Uh, no. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to answer that. What I want to say is. Go ahead. I want to say. Talk about your pocket square. I think the fact that we are having a, a panel conversation about post or whatever gender and food means we are not post. I mean, mm. by definition, ah, oh. we, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. We all, you wouldn't come because it would just be such a non-issue. It would be like, it would be like, you know, a panel on tall blonde people in Sweden. Like, but as long as there's <laughs> men and women, there's always going to be an issue. Exactly. You know? it's, it's, One hope. I, think, I mean, I think it's, we, we say it as though it's, a as though it's desirable. I think, I think, I mean, to Adam's point, what's desirable is to have people who can write well, which is yeah. the first criterion that ought to be 
uh, achieved, um, and then have something to say, which it don't always go hand in hand. <laughs> right, um, right. And then say it in a way that's stylish or stylized or whatever, whether they're men or women. I'm, I'm not. I'm not advocating for a post-gender world because because I like one over the other. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but because I because I think that's not that's a boring that's that, that's it becomes a non-issue and that's the, not the, the, the one word you didn't use is useful. Uh, it doesn't, Rini, writing doesn't Rini, have to be useful. I don't think. Writing doesn't have to be writing about food doesn't have to be useful. Only, Rini, Rini? only in you know when you're writing instructional manuals or yes sometimes. See and, and personally I'm going to jump in here. Yeah. Personally, I think all writing about food needs to be useful and needs to be correct because it is the most important thing in the world. Because if we get the wrong information in popular culture because it was a good turn of a phrase, it can kill whole generations. I mean, seriously, it's, it's real stuff. It needs Lauren, to be correct. Lauren, oh, it needs yeah. to be correct. Yeah. All right, yeah. as correct yeah. as we can be. Yeah. Yeah. It useful yeah. to me, but it yeah. inspires right. me to want yeah. to know Go to Paris and eat a steak. Yeah. Well, I think that's useful. Expense account and yeah, that, yeah. You know, I was saying, to get back to photography, which I think is, is hugely important, and yeah. especially in magazines and blogs now, where people take such amazing photography mm. for their food blogs. And, I, and what's interesting about that is that, I, I personally, I think if you look at the magazine that really sort of changed the way food photography is shot was Saver back in the 90s and Christopher Hersheimer, who happens yeah. to be a woman. Yeah. But it was the first time yeah. food was shot. If you look at Bon Appetit back then, it was yeah. these shellacked turkeys and <laughs> tweezed and like bad lighting and tablecloths with you know napkin rings. And then here comes Christopher. It's like, all right, hold this platter, natural light, just shoot the food. We're not going to style it. We're not going to have any sort of fake, you know, whatever oil on it. And that was a tremendous sort of accomplishment and, 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 and in a sense that was in, I guess more masculine in that it wasn't flourishing and it wasn't doctored it wasn't done up it was just very honest like the writing was and that and now you see that style on every I said every food blog out there um, but back at the time in the eight, 90s and 80s no one shot like that you know, uh, and I, that's a confident move to say, you know what, I'm just going to take my camera and some natural light and a beautiful plate of gnocchi and just shoot it. And, a fairly, and, a, and a fairly brilliant Martha, eye. Martha, Martha yeah. Stewart. Yeah, yeah, Martha, yeah, but I think Martha, yeah, yeah. definitely the two of them. Right. But it's just, who could be more girly than Martha Stewart except the, you know, for that tough get out of my way. Yeah. <laughs> thing. But, but what she sold was ribbons and plums and whatever in a in a... Almost in a minimalist, natural. Oh, yeah. the food photography yeah. was spectacular. Well, on the flip side, I mean, look at Ina Garten, who I love, and yeah. no, no one cooks more. Just like every, I don't know a dude out there who doesn't want to eat everything she cooks. I mean, yeah, like take a cup, take a couple mother. of mayonnaise, deep fry this, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, from the mac and cheese or the chicken. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so I don't know. So she will be writing about cupcakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For a male audience, though. For a male audience. Well, actually, that, that's that's the question. So uh, we're, we're obviously this is a conversation that can go on for years, and, and it hopefully will. Uh, give us a final word, each of you, about the gender of writing about food, writing about food, and uh, uh, your focus, your gender. You, you get to pick one of the above, OK? <laughs> Uh, and we'll start with Mitchell and come back this way. We'll end up with Adam. Closing statement. Closing statement. Uh, it doesn't interest me, I will huh? say, because, I mean, like... Thanks I, for I, coming. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you're really no, doing. Obviously, it interests no. me. I mean, in the answer to the you're question... You're dismissing it. Like, I would never... I would never pick a book off a shelf and think, oh, this is a woman writer, I'm not going to read it, or oh, this is a male writer, I'm going to read it. Sometimes I have picked a book off and thought, oh, this is a gay writer, and I should see what this is about. And often that's very disappointing, so don't <laughs> do that very much. But, but it, to me, it's, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, I guess I'm agreeing with Adam and, and with all of the panelists, really, that, that it's about the writing. It's about the emotional connection. Women have different experiences in the world from men, especially in the world of food, and those that can communicate them and write about them and, and get you excited or upset or to stimulate you somehow about them are the ones I want to read. I don't care who they are, and I, I don't care what it is. Rini? Too boring. I totally agree with him. Uh, I, I think it's all about the writer. It's always about the writer, no matter what the subject is. Uh, if the writer's good enough, then I go with her or him. <laughs> and I, 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 I don't want to dismiss the whole history of women writing as just a lot of tea room stuff. Right. All right. Well, to that end, uh, Lisa, what's, what's your final word about this? Um, yeah, for me, it can't be. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Or Lauren, Lauren, you first. I'm sorry. Clearly. She's young, but. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I probably should. Lauren, we're going to give you the final word. Um, no, 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 uh, wait, wait. We're going to give you the final word. So think about this and write something in crayon. High pressure. Okay. So Lisa, I was right. 
Lisa? Um, yeah, for me it is. It's all about the writer and the voice and the story that they're telling. All right, and Adam? You know, I was just, I mean, what I always say to, to young writers is just write like yourself. Because if you try to sound like someone else, you're going to fail. So it doesn't matter whether you're a guy or a woman, whoever, just write in your own voice. I mean, it takes a hard, lot, it can be difficult to find your own voice, but that's what you really need to try to do. Okay, Lisa, uh, in, in, your, in, in your, in your, I mean, sorry, Lauren, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Lauren, in closing, I want to know from you, now that you've heard from all these august people who have been doing this for a long, long time, and who have, and can afford to have this long view. Does august mean old? <laughs> yes, it does. It means older than springtime. Uh, how does this, how does this work for you? What are you, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, they should all watch out for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, I couldn't have said it better myself. Please join us. Uh, a woman who started a cheese company that's now owned by a Frenchman called Laura Chanel Chev is back there. A man who's cooking a uh, 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 coffee cake that his mother in Indiana cooked for many, many years is back there. We have jams and jellies from Brooklyn and Detroit. What well, can I tell you? They're brothers. Uh, and, and please continue the conversation. Thank you all for coming. I hope we see you in June. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>